1998, um, pre-internet for most people, and uh, I had pitched an idea to Prudential that they had effectively created the modern world of financial services in, in, the, in 1845. They were the very first financial services company in the world uh, that went out and sold products to uh, ordinary people. Uh, and given that the internet was going to change the way financial services worked, uh, wouldn't it be a great idea if they created the world of digital financial services for the 21st century? Um, and after quite a long process, I walked away with a check for 80 million pounds um, and a mandate to go and put that into the world. That, of course, was egg. Um, and that was 1998. Two and a half years later, to Ju July 2000, um, I just spent three weeks flying literally all around the world on a private jet, uh, a Goldman Sachs private jet. Uh, not as glamorous as it sounds, particularly when you sleep on it. Um, and we'd, I'd been pitching egg to investment managers and pension funds and other people who buy shares in companies because we're floating it on the stock exchange. So it floated in July 2000 at a value of £1.3 billion, pounds, uh, just two and a half years after launch. Um, and I say it was, I was like a three-week process to do that. It was eight, nine times oversubscribed, this IPO. And so what happens when you do an IPO is the brokers that set it up for you, Goldman's in our case, uh, they invite you to... Uh, watch the first day's trading, or to see the first few minutes of trading anyway. So you go into Goldman's and you go onto the trading floor. And they start with breakfast, which consisted solely of champagne. <laughs> now remember, I'd just come into the UK that morning on a jet, having been away for three weeks. Um, so I had the breakfast, and then I watched the shares, and I watched the price shoot up, and I watched it settle back down again to about 10 to 15% above the issue price. And Goldman said, that's it, job well done. I said, God, how did you know that would happen? And they have some miraculous way of making that happen. The price goes up, all their friends who bought the shares sell them, and then the price kind of settles down again. So it's kind of the way IPOs work. So, fine, watch that happen. Wondered out, it's about 10 o'clock by now, into a taxi to the London Stock Exchange. So the next thing you do when you trade it on the main board of the Stock Exchange, uh, the first day, they invite you to guess what? A champagne reception. <laughs> so I go in, I have the champagne reception, and they tell me all about the stock exchange and all the services they can give us and this, that, and the other. Um, and then I, I sort of staggered back towards my office, slightly drunk. <laughs> I'd been away for three weeks. I had my hair really badly needed a cut, you know? I was looking shaggy, messy, and slightly drunk. And I got back to my office to find a BBC TV crew <laughs> uh, saying, we want to do a 60-minute interview with you. Uh, because of your big news, you know, you've kind of resurrected the dot-com boom. It seemed to have failed, all the IPOs were failing, you've got it back up again, off it goes. Front, it was front page news, it was everywhere. And I did this 60 minute TV interview with the BBC, uh, which I have to tell you, it was not my finest hour. <laughs> and they used less than 30 seconds of it. <laughs> and, um, and I hope it's lost forever in the archives. One of these days it'll pop up on a blog somewhere and I'll think, oh my God, or one of those blooper things. Um, but anyway, the, the whole thing was very much front page news. It was all over the FT the next day. And there's a little paragraph on the FT, which I kind of, I've still got actually at home, where it said, Mike Harris can now put on his CV the creation of three iconic brands. Egg to go with Mercury to go with First Direct. I thought, that's cool, and if the FT tell you to do something, why don't you, know, you do it? So instantly put the creator of three iconic brands on my CV, still there today. But then I thought, ah, I wonder what an iconic brand is. And if anybody asks me, I put it on my CV now, I have to have an answer to that question. And I've spent much of the last 10 years pondering that. Um, and pondering it not for the sake of it, but wondering if I could sort of get at the architecture of iconic brands whether one could create one on demand, which would be quite a cool thing to do. Um, and the answer is you can if you've got 100 million pounds. So um, then I thought, well, what if we, I just started to th uh, approach the problem of having people think like an iconic brand? 
and behave like one. They don't actually have to become one. They don't have to spend their hundred million pounds. Maybe they can just behave like one. Would that have any power in it? And the answer is it has awesome power. Um, for an individual who is trying to project herself to the world as a resource that the world would find useful, through to a small company, trying to grow quickly, through to a division of a larger company, uh, through to a whole m massive, traditionally run, large company that wants to look at some way of transforming themselves. And a lot of the work I do is based on uh, this architecture of what it takes to become an iconic brand. Um, or to think like an iconic brand. And when you unravel it, there's some obvious things about an iconic brand. I mean, the first thing is it somehow becomes a symbol of its time. Um, now, you can't do that without a lot of money, so forget that. That isn't useful as an architectural piece. Uh, the second thing about an iconic brand is as much a social thing as it is a business thing. So it's talked about over dinner tables as much as it did over boardrooms. Again, you've got to be one to do that, so that isn't going to be very helpful to you. But if you then get below that and how they got to that status, what you get is really a couple of things that are useful to everybody. 